Good afternoon and welcome to the Governor's Master Plan for Aging Long-Term Services and Supports Subcommittee meeting. We're convening today to discuss the long-term care at home benefits. Um, next slide. This meeting is of course conducted virtually only. And next slide. We will be accepting public comment this afternoon. So here are the instructions for making public comment later on in our um, meeting today. We will share these instructions once again when it is your time to raise your hand and um, we can open up the lines then. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass this over to Kim McCoy Wade, the director of the California Department of Aging for um, welcome and introductions. Thank you, Amanda. There was a little bit of a technical glitch. If you could go back to the slide, uh, Nancy and Amanda, about how to participate so everybody is aware of the telephone number. Nope, go back one more, please. Or the webinar option, including the ID and password and the captioning and how to turn the captioning on with the captioning bug at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Thank you. With that, making sure we are all connected, I'm happy to welcome you. I'm Kim McCoy Wade the Director of the California Department of Aging and the convener of the Master Plan for Aging process with Secretary Galley. Uh, today, I am thrilled to be co-hosting this subcommittee meeting once again with the Department of Healthcare Services. We are here uh, with our third of the initial series of stakeholder convenings on the long-term care at home proposal. Uh, although we were just together two weeks ago, it is good to be together again so soon. Uh, you will see the majority of this meeting will be for listening and discussion. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback and we can't wait to hear more, but let me turn it over to my colleagues, Will Lightborn and JC Cooper for their welcome. Very briefly, I'm very grateful to everybody who has joined us this afternoon. Um, and as Kim McCoy-Wade just said, um, this really is a opportunity for us to, to listen more than it is to present. So with that, let me pass it on to um, our chief deputy, um, JC Cooper. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you again for joining us on a, a Friday afternoon to dig into um, a lot of really good information. We look forward to the conversation today um, to hear from the committee and the public in regards to um, the work that is being done on the long term care at home um, benefit design and uh, look forward to the conversation. Great. Before we dive into the agenda, let's do a roll call of our long-term services and support subcommittee member. And I will call your attention that we do have over 300 participants here. Again, a high number. So we will look forward to robust public comment. But let's do the roll call. Please, Amanda. Hi. Let's hope my internet remains through this. So I'm going to go ahead and call the names of all LTS subcommittee members. If I have called your name and you are on the phone only, please raise your hand by the hitting star nine on your telephone to make sure we give you over to our list list. So I will go ahead with Anna Acton. Presence um, once I call your name. Um, Maya Altman. I'm here, thank you. Catherine Blakemore. Here, thank you. Catherine Berger. Christina Bass Hamilton. Donna Benton? Here. Patty Berg? Here. Craig Cornett? Here. Susan DeMorris? Here. Karen Feist? Julia Figueroa McDonough? Here. Karen Kiesler? Here. Marty Lynch? Peter Mendoza? Here. Good afternoon. Lydia Missoula? Here. Marty Amoto. I'm here. Claire Ramsey. Here. Ellen Schmeeding. Here. Sarah Steenhausen. Here. Hello. Jeff Tom. Here. Nina Weiler Hartnell. And Brandy Wolf. I'm here. Welcome everyone, that concludes our roll call. Great, let's go right into the updates from the departments. DHCS, wanna kick us off please? Of course. Uh, 
one second, let me turn my video back on. All right, there we go, so everyone can see me. Um, so uh, our, our update today will be pretty short um, as, uh, you know, just making sure people are tracking the Department of Healthcare Services and TDA and others. We released an issue brief prior um, to the previous meeting and um, we are still working on updates uh, to what would be released in the next version. Um, and really listening to the feedback in regards to timelines, engagement, there's kind of two main updates for, for everybody today. Um, the first, I'm gonna give an update in regards to uh, when you'll see something from us next and kind of next steps, as well as um, just an overview to make sure everyone's understanding the, um, the amount of stakeholder engagement that the uh, departments are, are doing. Um, so I'll start with the stakeholder engagement piece first, and then I'll kind of give an overview of next steps in regards to meetings and, and um, benefit design briefs from, from um, the departments. So, um, you know, in addition to the documents we've put out and the meetings that we've had here with the LTSS subcommittee, um, we just wanted to make sure people were um, understanding the extensive stakeholder engagement that the departments are undergoing. Uh, we have held now um, over 22 ad hoc meetings um, with over 19 organizations. Um, and uh, we have, which is equaling over kind of 20 to 24 hours of um, meeting time, stakeholder engagement. And that's outside of this, these meetings that we've been having here with the LTSS subcommittee and meetings there. So that's in addition to those. Um, we have, you know, six agencies working on this behind the scenes. And so I uh, really just wanted to, um, you know, underscore how much we appreciate um, all the various stakeholders, providers, associations who have engaged with us on this. Um, oftentimes we're reaching out to those agencies, but more times they're reaching out to us, getting on a call, bringing their subject matter experts um, to the table um, or providers within their associations to the table to really help inform the policy. And we've just greatly appreciated um, the collaborative nature in which many of you have come to the table to have conversations with us. Um, we recently even are engaging with uh, providers in two other states and we have other meetings um, on the books for that, as well as some um, separate meetings around disparities and equities, et cetera. And so we really just appreciate um, the time and effort people have put into um, this, uh, really demonstrating the importance of what we are working on together. So thank you for that. Um, given that, uh, we are still working on a large number of, of updates based on feedback in areas we, we know we need to provide additional detail as well as interactions with our other programs. Um, so we will be um, taking the next few weeks, um, you know, four to six weeks to um, prepare our, our next draft. We also are very committed to continued engagement and so we would like to have, you know, two to three more uh, meetings in regards to our interaction on this um, or benefit build and so um, more information will come from us in regards to save the date for times locations etc um, and how we can engage in um, continuing this conversation throughout the rest of of 2020 to, um, to ultimately have a good recommendation for the policy moving forward um, so those were really my two main updates just uh, a thank you for all the extensive hours of stakeholder engagement that we have been able to work with you um, many of you on, um, as well as our next steps for meetings. So, Kim, that's uh, back to you. Great, thanks. And uh, really, my update is very short as well. CDA just wants to underline some of those partnerships uh, as well. Uh, the equity work group of the master plan, we have uh, designated leaders like Dr. Lincoln and Dr. Benton who will continue uh, and do some additional adv advice to us with Latina Coalition for he uh, Healthy California and other key partners. So, I want to particularly shout out that equity advisory meeting we'll be having next week. And again, the invitation is out there for more of those uh, conversations as JC mentioned. Also wanna thank the legislature, great conversation, dialogue, feedback from uh, many key leaders and members uh, getting uh, their expertise on, and partnership on this proposal. And then I think we've also heard from our Together We Engage uh, public engagement uh, wanting some more easily accessible information. Uh, and so part of that's more time for public comment today, but we're also looking at visuals and graphics and ways with it, with the LTSS subcommittee, we can uh, tell the complicated story of LTSS in a more friendly and accessible way to the public. So all of those uh, critical uh, steps are being taken. It's great to have some more time to do that in partnership with all of you. With that, unless there's any other department or administration updates, I'd like to hand it over to our subcommittee members who um, 
at the last meeting ha had uh, two deliverables that they were going to present today, and they have updates on both fronts, as I understand it. So are we ready to go to that spot? Sure. Okay. So um, go ahead, Kim. Sorry. Exactly. Catherine Blakemore, uh, please take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Um, First, I want to just um, acknowledge what I view as really good news from uh, both departments that you're going to allow more time for work on this. Um, I think that's really incredibly wise and I think it will do a lot to advance a proposal that is from the LTSS subcommittee more consistent with the values that we've identified as critical to that allow for better design of a program that will meet uh, needs and allow for you know, further discussion. So just thank you, JC and Will Lightborn and Kim for uh, that, that good news. I'm, I'm, I am grateful and I'm sure that uh, other members of the committee are also grateful. Um, over the last two weeks, uh, members of the committee have been working really hard. It's an incredibly talented, um, committee of, of people that have a lot of depth. Um, we have been working on two fronts. One is on an immediate crisis response and the other is on what are the elements that we believe need to be in um, a long-term care um, at home benefit um, and really fleshing that out in some ways so that you can, that the state agencies can really hear from us what that, from our perspective, what that needs to look like. So we're hoping to do two things today. One, um, provide some detailed information about what we uh, believe needs to be uh, steps taken to address the crisis at hand, and then also an update about where we are in addressing the, um, the larger questions of what is an uh, augmentation to a long-term uh, care at home benefit look like, um, and the, the concrete things that we think need to be in that. Um, I'm going to turn it over in just a minute to two uh, colleagues who are going to go through uh, some slides about the crisis part. I, I think as, as my colleague uh, Marty Amoto would remind all of us, this is not a time of business as usual. Um, we are in the midst of a crisis. And part of what the LTSS committee strongly believes that in a crisis, we need to figure out both short-term solutions, what can we do right now, as well as longer-term planning for um, an additional benefit. And that's brought home every time we look at the data where we see the impact on um, people 65 and older in terms of high rates of positivity uh, impact uh, with COVID, the numbers of deaths, um, uh, particularly among Black, Latino, and Asian Pacific Islander communities. Um, large numbers of death continue to occur in congregate settings, uh, which impacts not only the people that are living there, but the staff who are working there. Um, and it's because of that that we want to spend um, a good amount of time today just walking through what we think is the right response to um, addressing this immediate crisis. So with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over um, to Lydia and to Claire, Lydia Misalides and Claire Ramsey, um, who are going to uh, walk through um, the set of slides. And I want to just acknowledge how hard uh, the, the two of them, along with Ellen Schmeeding and the other members of the committee, have been working over the last two weeks to, to put this together. It's actually quite um, remarkable. So thank you for all of that. Thanks, Catherine. And thanks. I um, want to start also by thanking um, the departments for giving us this time to really present our immediate crisis response information and to really um, have this conversation uh, broadly and publicly. And um, we are going to go through a lot of information today. We um, really want to see this as the beginning of a conversation and um, while we are going to talk about uh, immediate crisis response, we want to be clear that what we're talking about is not sort of the broad based, you know, everything. We're not talking about everything crisis response and COVID related. We really are trying to think about um, how to answer the charge around um, really keeping people safe and healthy in our community settings, um, how to um, help 
divert people away from congregate settings um, and into their back into their home and community. And I know this term has sort of gone back and forth about whether people want to use it much, but sort of how do we decompress, how do we decompress nursing homes um, and, and keep people safe? So with that, um, we have worked over the last two weeks to really put together a list of very concrete proposals that we wanted to present today. Um, a couple things I just want to say right at the top is that this list is not a list of every good idea. It is not a list of um, the only worthy ideas. It is a list that we were able to pull together in the last two weeks that we think is responsive. Um, we do think that it works, these solutions work together and are um, creating um, a web of, of solutions that we hope will help keep people safe at home and in the community. Um, but we are certainly open to new ideas, more ideas, different ideas. Um, we know there's a lot of expertise out there and, and we are definitely interested in listening. So what we will be presenting is what we have pushed forward in the last two weeks. Um, and hopefully we'll hear more comments and feedbacks from there. And with that, if we can go to the next slide. Um, thank you. Catherine did a great job teeing this up. Um, you know, I think we just wanted to really acknowledge with this response that um, the COVID crisis is getting worse in California. This is not unique to um, con congregate settings. Um, we are seeing community surge as well. We know the state is doing a huge amount of work to, to get on top of this. And we hope that um, our place in this is to help provide um, good thinking around this and, and help provide solutions um, and add to the already extensive work that's being done statewide to address this. Um, we also really want to address the fact that the COVID crisis is not impacting the state evenly. Um, there are huge disparities occurring um, and inequities in infections and death. Um, we are seeing that uh, Latino, Black, and API Californians um, are more likely to be infected and to die from this disease. Um, and those who are over 65 are even more at risk. Um, there are a lot of reasons for that and they're complicated, but we know that some of this is directly linked to uh, racism and systemic disparities and, and disproportionate impact on communities of color in the healthcare system. And so we want to work thoughtfully to help fight against that and to make sure we're advancing anti-racist policies. Um, we also wanna say that we've seen data intersected with poverty numbers where we can really see that um, these numbers are even more stark among low income communities. So um, we wanna be thoughtful. And it's also why a lot of our recommendations are around Medicaid based programs since those are serving some of our most vulnerable Californians. Um, and lastly, we want to acknowledge that there are different areas of the state being impacted in different ways. Um, we do have some data and maps to show in the next couple slides, but um, certain areas are being hit harder at different times. Um, right now, it looks like the Central Valley is being particularly hard hit. And so we want our solutions to be targeted and thoughtful to where communities are really struggling and suffering right now. Um, and with all that, we really focused on what resources do we have in place now? I think one of the things that really occur was evident as we went through these solutions is that California does a lot around home and community-based services. It has a lot of programs. It has a lot of strengths. It has a lot of people who are working very hard. And we think by you know, using flexibilities, increasing access, increasing um, availability to, for people that we're really going to be able to make a difference using the resources we have at hand um, and that these can help bridge um, the gap while working on other longer term solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So this, there's a lot of data on this slide. I am certainly not a data expert. We just wanted to point out that, you know, as we said, things are, um, you know, cases are growing again in the state. There is an uptick in deaths. Um, you know, we, we want to see that go in the other direction. Um, this is, these are statistics not specific to congregate settings. These are just overall in the state. I mean, you can see that the number of deaths is starting to really spike again. Um, 
And we just wanted to use this to point out some of the disparity data where we can see that, you know, people over 65 make up 11% of cases, but over 75% of deaths in the state. Um, and we can also see with this data, the disproportionate impact on um, Latino, Black, and API communities, where they're overrepresented uh, based on their share of the population in infections and deaths. Um, next slide, please. Next, we wanted to point out um, the ways in which uh, data is shifting. Um, California has had a lot of data being put out and available. We really appreciate that because it helps us get a much better sense of what's going on. Um, this data is all very dynamic and being updated daily. So this is a shot, in, a, like a snapshot in time data that we're showing here. Um, but there is facility data being released every day um, on the California Department of Public Health website. So as of July 30th, um, we're really seeing the hot spots, as we mentioned, in a couple of places. Um, we're seeing real growth in cases in facilities in Merced and Madera County in the Central Valley. Um, we're seeing uh, pockets in Calusa, Mendocino, Napa, and San Luis Obispo. And then we are seeing growth um, in most of the Southern California counties and in the Bay Area counties. But again, this data is so dynamic that it's worth looking back um, at frequent intervals because you'll see that, you know, things rise and fall and change. And there has been a huge amount of work to control infection, to prevent death. And we really want to acknowledge that and say that we know efforts are ongoing within facilities to, to get control and, and have already been taken to improve the numbers. And you can see that from the longitudinal data that, that things have really dipped in a major way since earlier in the crisis. But we know we can continue to work and prevent deaths. And, and we really appreciate that everyone's goal has been the health and safety of our older adults and people with disabilities in California. And so with that, we'll go to the next slide. Um, just want to highlight, you know, we have uh, been, again, the state has been releasing data around uh, positive cases and deaths. Um, our next slide is more of an overview of, that Lydia will do, an overview of sort of, oh, I'm sorry, go back to the slide before. Thanks. Um, she'll talk more about the overarching picture. And I do want to say that this data is a snapshot of, you know, positive cases and, and deaths between um, residents and um, workers. But, um, you know, we know that the nursing home um, population is much larger than this. And again, we are seeing um, a lot of efforts to, to help improve safety and health within facilities, but we still wanna see what our committee can do as the LTSS committee to really help um, avoid nursing home placements and um, long-term stays in, in congregate settings where appropriate. Um, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Lydia to comment on any of the slides that I've discussed so far and to move us forward. Now you've really done a great job, Claire, of painting that picture. And I know for myself personally, I'm constantly reminded of uh, what is happening um, with the overall uh, coronavirus spread in California because I'm conducting weekly webinars for our members and uh, we're constantly reminded of the need to stay vigilant and um, follow public health directives. So um, thank you for that lead in. And um, I'm certainly not a, a nursing home expert and I just wanted to acknowledge that we've greatly appreciated insights from our fellow LTS as subcommittee members and particularly Craig Cornett in, in this space, um, who really has a, a deeper understanding of what is currently happening in nursing homes and uh, for those residents. But we wanted to just share this slide because it, it illustrates why the subcommittee feels such urgency to move forward with a crisis response that we're gonna dig into a little bit more deeply here in a moment. And I think what was really um, important to me to realize here is that um, we have not only, oh, I think we're going to, um, excuse me, we're going to the next slide. I, sorry, I forgot to say that. And what's important I think to look at with this slide is a couple of things. Um, we understand that 
it's a small minority of people who are living in nursing facilities for a year or longer and uh, critical for us to deeply understand why and uh, acknowledge that oftentimes it's a lack of housing and other social supports that are preventing them from moving away from the nursing home. Um, and you can see here that 84% are discharged after three months or less. And many of those people are going to be those who are recovering in a nursing facility for the reasons that are listed in the very last bullet point here, things that would be uh, leading them from hospital to nursing home rather than hospital to home. So a lot of that is rehabilitative care for hip replacements of any type, uh, perhaps somebody who's had a very significant um, surgery and needs a medical uh, long-term recovery with a lot of medical support, nursing oversight during that time, uh, wound care, for example, um, people who have been, who've suffered from gunshots or some other kind of trauma, car accidents and so on, again, who need a, a longer both medical and rehabilitative recovery, but their trajectory is to go home at some point. Um, so you can see that there's a significant number of people who it is possible through some very intensive effort, efforts uh, that uh, we may be able to help support getting home um, more quickly or avoid having to um, be in the nursing home at all uh, with significant support at home. So those were the things I wanted to highlight here. And then we still would really like to get, if it's possible at some point from our state partners, some data breaking down this uh, resident information um, in terms of SPDs and duals. And I think, again, that would help us sort of scope out the population that we, we may be targeting, at least for this part of the response. Um, so next slide. What we've captured here is, is a whole lot on one slide. And each of these bullet points uh, could probably lead us into an hour discussion. So we're only going to give you a, a very quick overview. I'm going to cover a few of these and, and then Claire will as well. So um, we asked ourselves the question when we began to uh, realize that, that the talent that was sitting around the table at the SP, uh, LTSS subcommittee was in a position to really help this, um, the state respond rapidly to this growing crisis. And we asked ourselves, um, what, uh, what are the barriers today to going home from a hospital stay, for example, and for leaving the nursing home, or for even preventing someone from having to access a nursing home or hospital? And then we asked ourselves, what are the LTSS resources that exist today that without a long drawn out process, we could rapidly redeploy with, of course, help from our state partners, um, CMS, our managed care partners, hospitals, and so on, um, to really make a difference in how we are responding to this crisis and keeping people safe and uh, avoiding situations where they are more exposed to infection from the coronavirus. So uh, the CCT program, I think many of you are familiar with, it stands for California Community Transitions. It is a, a waiver program. It's called uh, Money Follows the Person at the federal level and California has uh, enacted this program now for a number of years. And its sole laser-like focus is to transition people from a nursing home to the community. Um, one of the barriers we identified, and we have many partners on the subcommittee who are more expert and actually uh, carry out this program um, and have, have lent their expertise to the discussion um, and will describe it much better than I can here in the next five seconds. Uh, but the barrier that we've identified is that the federal law requires a 90 day stay in the nursing home before someone can transition out. So we would like to see uh, what kind of efforts can be made to change that or uh, provide a state only funded program perhaps that could uh, more quickly um, get people out of nursing home who don't um, meet that requirement for the things that are needed that are not available and funded through other, other means. So clearly there's a lot of individualized support and coordination that goes into this. And as I mentioned, housing is, is um, extremely important for those who have lost their housing or who maybe didn't have stable housing when they went in. 
Um, the next thing is emergency authorization for enrollment in CBAS. So this is something I have uh, a lot more expertise in. And we've prepared some recommendations that relate to, uh, I think, fairly uh, easily and quickly, I'm hoping, uh, would allow for emergency authorization for services to begin, whether it's uh, through managed care or through fee-for-service. And we're also identifying a need uh, because people who access CBS have to be enrolled in managed care, uh, a need for expedited enrollment into Medi-Cal managed care. And that may also benefit people in other realms, uh, not just in, in our realm. Um, the second piece is related to MSSP where the instability of the rate has uh, caused a great deal of instability in our service system. And so we feel sending a strong message that uh, these programs uh, will benefit and be able to do even more once they can see their rates are stabilized, uh, whether it's through managed care, through fee-for-service in general, uh, would, would go a long ways to helping with that. And MSSP, in addition, has been um, asking for and believes that they can contribute to this crisis response more fully if they can have an increase in their slots. They are a waiver program, a 1915C, and so they are limited by um, the state's contract with CMS as to the number of slots or seats, if you will, that um, can be um, served in that program at any, any given time. So then the next one um, we're going to talk about is, or the next few we're gonna talk about some waivers that Claire is going to discuss with you briefly, Claire. Thanks, Lydia. Um, so I'm going to talk, um, starting with the um, Home and Community-Based Alternatives Waiver, uh, HCBA. Um, HCBA is another 1915C waiver program. Um, it offers a wide array of medical and home and community-based services to eligible individuals who are all at a nursing home level of care. Uh, it is also a slot-based program and is capped right now um, with a waiting list of, at least as of March of 2020, 836 people. Um, there are particular rules about how people come onto the waiver, including uh, favoring getting people out of institutional settings and back into the community uh, versus favoring people who are living in the community already and need the HCBA waiver to prevent institutionalization. Um, and what we think is that this is a very uh, intensive level of services that are already offered through HCBA. We think that expanding the number of slots um, to 5,000 more slots could basically help clear the waiting list um, completely, could help with some of the highest need individuals who are at risk of going into nursing homes and helping more people come out of nursing homes. And um, we think that it can also be a solution for those individuals who are already receiving the maximum level of in-home supportive services hours uh, because one of the benefits offered on the HCBA waiver is additional personal care services hours. And this could be a good bridge to make sure that people are getting enough personal care to stay safely in the community. Um, so that's HCBA. Um, the Assisted Living Waiver, which is the ALW um, acronym. Assisted Living Waiver is what it sounds like, which is the state uh, for a very small number of people has uh, waiver slots to allow people to have their assisted living paid for. Um, again, this is a 1915C waiver. It is not just slot based, which it is, but it's also geographically based in that not every county participates. Right now there's only 15 counties on this um, particular waiver. Um, we are recommending expansion of slots. We want to be very thoughtful about this expansion. I know there is concern that assisted livings are, you know, are correctly considered other congregate um, living facilities and um, there have been concerns and also um, real need for health and safety protocols within assisted living. So we certainly want, would want to roll out any slot expansion in a way that protects health and safety of both residents and of people working in assisted living facilities. Um, but we think that this is a very 
critical piece of the puzzle, especially for individuals who do not have homes to return to or whose uh, situations do not allow them to live um, in a less uh, congregate setting for, for whatever reason. Maybe they don't have enough uh, support in other ways. Um, so we would like to see the assisted living waiver expanded by another 10,000 slots and the geographic reach of it widened um, so that more um, individuals can be helped by this. And again, we would love to see this, um, the geographic increases be thoughtfully targeted to communities that are most effective. Um, next um, is the recommendation around increased support for the Caregiver Resources Center. Um, this is also not my area of expertise, but um, I have great partners in Donna and Nina who are the experts and have given me the information around uh, the concerns, which are basically any, any solutions we implement here are going to draw heavily on unpaid caregivers to provide significant amounts of support um, within any system. Um, and we need to recognize that by relying on them, um, they are going to need support as well, which is exactly what the caregiver resource centers do. Um, right now, about 80% of the care provided in the state is being provided by unpaid family caregivers, um, who right now, because of COVID, are more socially isolated, are trying to care for both children and you know parents simultaneously, and are really trying to um, minimize trips to the hospital, to other congregate settings, and are really trying to work to keep people home. So we believe that increased investment in the uh, caregiver resource centers uh, is vital to making sure that people are supported while they do all that hard work. Um, and so there is a specific um, uh, amount of money that we could see being invested into caregiver resources to help improve um, support for unpaid caregivers. Um, and then the last one I'm gonna talk about before turning it back to Lydia is required COVID testing before discharge from hospital. Um, again, I am not the expert in this and um, was helped along understanding the issue by Craig uh, Cornett, who is much more in the weeds and knowledgeable in this area. But one thing we're seeing is that at this moment, hospitals do not need to test um, before discharging individuals. And we think this is going to be vital to um, employing a strategy that actually keeps people safe. So whether somebody is being discharged to home or discharged to um, some sort of congregate uh, facility, including a nursing home, um, it's really important for who, wherever they're going to know whether they are testing positive or negative at that moment. Um, so we not only need testing, but we need testing with results that are really rapid, you know, within 24 to 48 hours. So people have an accurate um, understanding of somebody's um, uh, status as they come out of a hospital. And that will allow both the home setting and a congregate setting to more appropriately uh, provide infection control, to um, use isolated units if needed, to do all the other things that are being deployed now, but in a much more thoughtful fashion. Um, so we think that's a good solid recommendation to um, help people keep safe as people are being discharged. Uh, Lydia, I'll turn it back to you. Yes, thank you. Um, we completely understand why the prioritization of protective personal equipment has had to be for first responders and uh, yeah, hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That might have been a moment of zen there, I'm not sure. Um, for hospitals and first responders and so on. Um, but I, I just think that as we've been talking about this whole response and how everything connects together, that if we are serious and if this recommendation does move forward and there's energy behind it to actually begin to operationalize it, um, there will need to be significant attention paid to PPE and getting that down to the community level. I know the Office of Emergency Services has made a, a, a huge commitment to getting and distributing more PPE to the community, uh, but I understand as well that things like the N95 masks are still prioritized to first responders. So something we just have to think through a little bit more and we'll rely heavily on our state partners 
to help us um, to do that. And um, the other thing I want to talk about briefly uh, is a, a concept that we have educated ourselves about at the LTSS subcommittee and have spoken to people in San Francisco to learn more how they created a community living fund there. And the idea just made so much sense in this con context of emergency response where um, if we had a flexible pot of money that could be used to uh, facilitate health, safety, uh, getting people home when otherwise they might uh, go to, a, to an institutional setting or keeping people out of institutional settings, hospitals or nursing homes and so on, um, it would be a tremendous investment, small amount of money that could do an incredible amount of good. So we'd, we'd like to think through with um, all of you how we might create a California version of this community living fund that we'd like to call the community, or excuse me, the California Dignity Fund uh, that would serve as that sort of a bridge program, a way to access purchase of service and so on to help people um, be at home. And I'm thinking in the emergency situation we're in right now, for example, in, in my world with our community-based services adult day programs, um, we would love to be able to access things like um, oximeters and uh, blood pressure cuffs and other medical supplies and equipment that are not easily obtainable through Medicaid or Medi-Cal, um, excuse me, Medicare or Medi-Cal. And uh, it could go a long way to helping people uh, be safe at home, particularly now that people are avoiding doctor's visits and so on. So um, just something for us to think about a little bit more deeply um, on um, how we might be able to do that with, with all of you and our, our legislative partners. And then uh, Claire's going to talk about IHSS, and we're going to dig into sort of the heart of our proposal, which is our rapid response intensive care management. Claire? And Lydia and Claire, if I may ask you to uh, move through this part in the next five minutes so that we can continue with the rest of the agenda, we'd be so grateful. Thank oh, you. Oh, sure. Thanks. We will Kim, do it. The time check. Um, so I'll just quickly uh, say about I IHSS. Uh, one of our proposals is also to um, make it easier for people to access IHSS when they're being discharged from the hospital. Um, there are particulars about this, I don't need to go into it, but there is right now a mechanism for a preliminary assessment uh, to happen uh, before someone leaves the hospital. It's just challenging to do it given how the realities of hospital discharge work uh, and the realities of how um, heavily burdened counties are with IHSS work. So we want to figure out a way to use and expand that preliminary assessment to get IHSS services started right away for people. Um, that's all I'll say about that. And Lydia, I will turn it back to you for rapid response case management. Next slide, please. We can, um, we'll do this quickly, although this is um, uh, sort of core to, to what our proposal uh, entails. And we'll rely on our state partners, our managed care partners, our local community partners in our LTSS network to really operationalize this. But uh, basically, this is just a little uh, flow sheet to show you what a discharge process from hospital to home or NIF to home might, might look like and how things could work out as we could deploy our LTSS expertise at the local level, creating a hub of people that the hospital could call upon to help with developing a, a, a discharge plan that would uh, get people back to home quickly and um, safely with LTSS and medical supports. Um, and um, clearly this will require very intensive 24-7 uh, access to people in the community who can work with the discharge planner to make that happen. And uh, ideally discharge planning actually starts on day one. Uh, when somebody enters an institution. So I'll leave it at that. I think the chart is, is pretty self-explanatory and obviously every single one of these circles has a whole lot behind it um, in terms of work, but uh, the concept is that we deploy our expertise at the local level to assist our hospitals and our nursing homes to get people home safely. Next slide. And the way we were thinking about this again, very high level is to start uh, develop this concept more fully we could then begin to work with the state and others to identify communities and geographies where we're seeing a, a big uh, 
incidents of infection where we have a strong network that's willing and able and managed care partners who are willing and able to engage in this and, and test it out basically start with one or two small areas of rural and urban, uh, really test out the idea uh, quickly and uh, then uh, be able to take that knowledge and experience and um, expand it even more broadly. So uh, this I think is a pretty well, uh, what shall I always say, a, a well-worn kind of a model to be able to test out a new concept, but be able to move it out quickly uh, once, we, once we test it at the local level. So um, in the interest of time, I think I'll stop there, Kim, and um, we'll yeah. go to the next slide. Well, actually, let's, take, let's stop for a second, if we may. This is the conclusion of your presentation I believe, on rapid response strategies. Is that correct? You are correct. Yes, thank okay. you, Kim. So yes. Let's take a second and just uh, um, uh, digest all of that before we do turn. I want to um, thank you for grounding us in the people and the families and the communities and the lives that really are what the long-term care at home proposal is one strategy to address uh, and reminding us why we're here and the urgency the disparities, the suffering. Uh, it is so important that we always start with the data and the people behind every single one of those numbers. So thank you for taking us through that so thoughtfully and carefully. You're welcome. Uh, and I also appreciate you broadening our lens that there are multiple strategies uh, part of the emergent response, short, medium, long term. Uh, and while this table is explicitly set to uh, workshop and think through long term care at home, there are multiple other strategies happening. And so I just want to address them briefly uh, for a moment. Uh, on the immediate rapid response, as many of you know, our departments and our programs partners have pivoted, have redesigned uh, community-based adult services going beyond uh, the walls, uh, several fle uh, uh, waiver flexibilities from our partners at DHCS, IHCS uh, flexibilities and changes to serve more people. So there have been an initial and ongoing wave of rapid response across the department to help people have the care and health at home that's needed. So thank you to all of you who've been part of that. Uh, I second, though, want to appreciate you saying, what more? What more could we do, given the urgency and the severity and the duration of this crisis? And I think to best vet all the conversation, all the content that was so thoughtfully presented today, we need uh, a different table with our secretary and with other departments involved, particularly social services, who I know is here today, but uh, also public health, also Department of Developmental Services, uh, other key partners at the table. So I would like to invite you that we will do that. As you all know, there has been a master plan for aging regular standing briefing of the secretary on emerging COVID priorities. So let's make this the next one. Let's make this proposal the focus of that time so that all the department directors and secretaries can be prepared and engage with this proposal on your crisis response recommendations and particularly rapid response intensive care management if there's more to do on that. Uh, the third piece I want to say is all of this conversation has been about home care. I just want to briefly um, uh, make sure that people are also up to date on the latest in skilled nursing facilities and their action plan. Uh, that has been uh, posted this week on the CDPH website, more information about their strategies, their approaches, uh, uh, the data, and I commend those links to you. We will try to share them here in the chat and in the follow-up materials uh, so that people can have them. But uh, again, more information in the continuing effort to do more, to do better uh, from our partners at CDPH in the SNF space. So I wanna make sure people are aware of that. Uh, and then before we do return to the more formal long-term care at home discussion where we do want to open it up for both your latest thinking and the public comment, I also of course want to remind people that we're also in the longest term backdrop of the master plan for aging 10-year horizon. Uh, we will be finishing those recommendations and as many of you uh, in the next uh, six weeks we'll finish with stakeholders uh, and then have the plan in December uh, and we did receive um, many recommendations uh, that will take that longer timeline, such as uh, new building designs and building standards for residential facilities to get into smaller uh, pods, if you will. Smaller units is just one example of the type of longer term horizon recommendations. So there is a table for that as well. And we welcome that innovative 
uh, system changing uh, uh, thinking. So I hope that was helpful both to the committee and to the public in understanding that this is complicated and we are moving uh, both within the walls of nursing homes and within the broader home and community service. And we're moving both on the immediate term, the medium term and the long term type, uh, time frame, and trying to leverage the expertise and collaboration we have at all places. Let me see if DHCS or if LT, uh, SS members, CUP committee members, have anything to say before we move to long-term care at home proposal discussion directly? I, I, my suggestion is that we move to the, 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 the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Will. Marty and Ellen, we're gonna hold if that's okay and keep moving. So we would love to hear from the subcommittee now on long-term care at home. Great, thank you so much, Kim. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to engage, continue our discussion on this issue. Um, and just to kind of reframe where we are, um, as you all have heard, the subcommittee has kind of divided its work into two main areas. One is um, crisis response, which Lydia and Claire just walked through and, and really focusing on the immediate issues related to what has been framed as the decompression of nursing homes to respond to the current crisis of today. But the second component of the LTSS subcommittee work group uh, was to outline what we believe is a meaningful framework for a state plan benefit. We recognize the tremendous opportunity there is in the um, concept of a home and community-based services state plan benefit. And we wanna be sure that any benefit that's crafted is done so that in alignment with the values that are outlined in the LTSS subcommittee report, um, which is a system that is easily navigable in a coordinated system of care. The workforce needs that are addressed for our, both our paid and unpaid workforce that all communities have access to home and community-based services um, and LTSS services, uh, regardless of place of residence. And that we um, also think through issues of financing and affordability. So the LTSS subcommittee has developed some preliminary concepts, but we didn't feel like we were fully ready to present them because we still want many of the questions that we have about the existing proposal answered. So uh, we're not in a position to be able to endorse or comment specifically on many of the different elements that have been presented for the state plan benefit, uh, for the long-term care at home plan benefit, but we're really appreciative that there's gonna be additional time. And so what we're planning on doing is the state will be bringing back its revised concept. And we, in the meantime, will also be bringing forward an alternative proposal that um, we believe will serve us also for some considerations of what a meaningful benefit framework, framework will look like. So with that, I just want to see if any of my subcommittee members, if Susan DeMorris, you also um, were leading this effort um, and others, um, if you wanted to add on to that. I don't have anything to add to that, Sarah, thank you. Okay. So I, I think just I'll close with saying that um, we're really looking forward to hearing from the public too about, you know, we know um, for the last two meetings, we've heard a lot about the questions um, that folks have and some of the, the, uh, the feedback on the proposed benefit. And we understand too that the department is still working through um, some of the specifics. So um, again, this slide just points to what we see as the really key components that are necessary for um, system change. And we are hopeful that a new long-term care at home benefit can meet these uh, values and the vision uh, at a long-term basis. So um, appreciate Great. the opportunity. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Well, let's, um, let's uh, switch to gallery view and open it up to the subcommittee for just the, sh uh, I would like to ask you all just for a couple minutes of comment so we can have a full half hour from the public. Once again, we have 414 people with us today. We'd like to hear from them, as many of them as possible. Uh, that input is essential. Uh, but Ellen, I see your hand is up. 
Hi, yes, thank you. I just want to say how much I appreciate being a part of this team, the Long-Term uh, Services and Support Subcommittee. It's one of the most stimulating experiences I have ever had during this time when we're putting our uh, best minds together to try to assist during the pandemic. So I think we have an excellent array of crisis uh, response recommendations put forward. And as mentioned, there are others. I just want to lend my support for the hub concept. I think definitely one of the uh, key success areas will be having an entity that can serve to marshal resources. I've got a social work background and I think that's, that's the kind of team members who know how to pull in resources and get things done. I also just want to make a pitch for PACE as another crisis response entity that is already providing many services similar to long-term uh, care at home and has that um, reliance on the interdisciplinary team. So that's it. Thanks a lot. Marty and Karen, and then we'll go to the public. Marty Yamoto. Yeah, Marty Yamoto, family member, CD Can California Disability Senior Community Action Network, just uh, in, in the uh, interest of time. Just want to emphasize uh, what my colleagues also mentioned regarding the rapid response, uh, the crisis response, and that these aren't two separate approaches um, towards addressing COVID. So the long-term care at home is a, is a very, uh, the concept is something that's very important, but the position and that I feel, and I think the rest of us feel, is that you can't move forward on the on a proposal or any new proposal without strengthening and making sure that our our response now is, is effective and is doing everything possible to keep every Californian safe. And so, it, I know it may seem like this is like the typical response that advocates make, you know, asking for more money. But we did a reset on our values and our, our advocacy to make sure that it was in tune with the public pandemic that is that we have never faced before. And we're hoping that, you know, everyone, policymakers, as well as all the other advocates and those listening on the phone, will do a reset and realizing that we have to respond differently. And we think this is the crisis response links directly to going into these new proposals. So. Just, that's just, and again, thank you for uh, leading this discussion, Kim. Karen Kiesler. Uh, thank you, Kim. Um, first, I want to say I appreciate the administration's willingness to be providing additional meetings and time for stakeholder input. I think it's really important that um, information about how long that process is going to be what all the opportunities are for stakeholders to provide input is really important because there's a lot of questions um, about the, ev the evolution of this proposal. Um, I also think that it would be helpful to have for your crisis response, a crosswalk with the legislature. Some of the things that are being recommended here today could require um, legislative or budget action and um, in particular on the CCT recommendations to be dealing with the short-term stays. Um, that's something where there is a bill that is in the legislature and certainly a willingness from the, the sponsors uh, to make that vehicle um, available for crisis response on the CCT. So again, thank you for extending this stakeholder process. Thank you. What I'd like to do now then is sum up our next steps and move to public comment. Maria and Nancy, if you can begin to queue our public comment. What we um, have heard today from these presentations, uh, a number of things. There will be additional stakeholder meetings coming. Uh, a schedule will come uh, that will become after there is a revised uh, proposal from DHCS and their sister departments on the long-term care at home benefit. The subcommittee was also working on their alternative concept for the long-term care at home benefit. So those will be taken up in the future meetings. And again, to Karen's point with more clarity on the timing, we wanna make sure we have the content ready to have those, those good conversations. Uh, meanwhile, there's a pending uh, data request. Claire will follow up with you on that. And uh, we will do a cross department agency briefing on the crisis response care at home proposals that were surfaced today. We'll do that in short order. So thank you for that. 
Uh, and then again, as you've heard, there are ongoing opportunities for one-on-one -on -one stakeholders, smaller group discussions, deep, deep dives on topics, and absolutely that includes discussion with our partners in the legislature, uh, always and ongoing. Uh, if out, uh, JC or Will, anything to add before we open for public comment? No, I would just thank the, the um, Long-Term Services and Support Subcommittee members for the work they put into this. It's, it's, it's very substantial. I do appreciate it. Yeah, agreed. Thank you very much for everyone's uh, presentation today and um, continued conversation. I sometimes say it's all the more impressive that this work is happening during this time, but I also know it's happening because of this time. So, so thank you both for uh, leading, uh, especially and uh, all the more so right now. Okay, Maria, Nancy, and Amanda, can you lead us through the public comment process? Sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, Andrea, I think you you were first up, so your uh, line's open on our end. Andrea, you're self-muted. You can find the unmute button at the um, lower left-hand side of your Zoom toolbar. We'll give you a couple seconds and then we might loop back around. Okay, um, Anna? Anna, your line's open on our end. Okay, how about Denise Liker? Denise? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Good afternoon. Denise Liker from Independence at Home, a community service of SCAN Health Plan. Um, I want to commend um, the LTSS subcommittee for putting together such a thoughtful look at from the ground up of what's really going on today. As we know, you know, the LTC at Home Benefit, you know, came to us as trying to help solve a crisis and some really great thoughtful work that you have done in, in looking at that. Um, what I want to also though throw out there on top of, of this look of, we, of, of looking at how those at the ground level already with the experience doing this work can help. I want to uh, kind of challenge us all to step back from thinking in the silos of programs. We tend to think of things like the 1915 C waiver, for instance, MSSP, and the box. So when those programs come up and when programs in those programmatic boxes of the different waivers and the different contractual requirements come up, often the first thing we hear is, oh, there's a limit because of, and it's usually because of, quote, the box. And I want to challenge us as we look at these really incredible times is that the box is bigger because underneath a box are organizations and systems of care that have been around for 40, more, 40 or more years at the ground level serving people in the community and keeping them at home and that we need to leverage the competencies and experience. A box can be changed or that or an entity that has a program that has a box could also add on because they're an agency or an organization of competencies and strengths that can really support this. And so thank you for letting me comment today. Um, thank you for sharing these, this, this direction and happy to help any way that I can or the MSSP side association can. Thank you, Denise. Next we have Peter Hansel. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I wanna also commend the subcommittee for some really great work, uh, some great thinking. Uh, I think we, I'm with CalPACE, the Association of the PACE Organizations. I think we would wholeheartedly agree there are a lot of missed opportunities uh, for improving uh, connections between hospital discharge planning and home and community-based programs and also missed opportunities for transitioning people out of uh, SNF settings back into the community. So. Definitely think the discussion's on the right track. I want to amplify, I think, uh, comments from Ellen uh, that uh, as PACE providers, uh, we, have, we think we have a lot to offer. We think we have a great skill set uh, to offer both in terms of helping to provide a long-term care at home benefit, but also to play a role in a rapid response system. Um, there are some specific barriers to PACE uh, that I, I guess we'd like to try to get into the discussion if we can one is the timing of enrollment in PACE. There's uh, uh, the timing involves uh, a level of care review process and approval, which can take uh, a couple of weeks. There is a problem of uh, getting in PACE and people into PACE uh, other than at the first of the month, <clears throat> which um, you know could be something that could be addressed through a, a mid-month enrollment or a transitional rate <clears throat> issue. And then I think there's some 
Also, pace could play a role more on the transition from uh, institutional settings to the community, uh, particularly people that ha have higher needs. If there was some way that there could be a supplemental rate, maybe an acuity-based rate uh, that uh, would uh, enable them to uh, their needs to be met. So, anyway, those are my comments. Thank you so much. Sure. And then just a gentle reminder, if we could keep public comments to about a minute per person, we do have quite a few folks that are in line. Um, Kim, Kim Selfin, you are on. Uh, I mistakenly raised my hand, so I'll lower it and see to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Um, next, we've got Paula, Paula Wilhelm. Hi, are you able to hear me? Yes. Great, thank you all. This is Paula Wilhelm with the County Behavioral Health Directors Association and um, appreciate the last three meetings and the great discussion of the long-term care at home benefit. We just wanted to highlight that there's a significant um, proportion of our mental health and um, substance use clients that are aging and in addition to their mental health and substance use needs have significant medical needs and these are some of the folks for whom it can be hardest to find um, appropriate living situations and um, sets of services. So we would really like to see um, the long-term care at home benefit become an option for these folks. And we think a couple of um, critical things that need to happen to make that work would be, um, we hope you'll look again at um, expanding beyond those who have their own um, individual homes and potentially including facilities like our CDSS licensed board and care facilities. And then we also, um, in addition to making sure that the eligibility criteria do not explicitly exclude those with a history of serious mental illness or substance use, we would want to see um, the contracted provider be behavioral health competent and so have um, training in identifying behavioral health needs, have that become part of the assessment process and um, then ensure that there are mechanisms in place to go ahead and coordinate um, behavioral health services that may be needed beyond what's included in the bundled package of services. So we will send some follow-up comments by writing but wanted to highlight those recommendations. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, next we've got Nicole Howell. Nicole. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Kim and the subcommittee for all of your hard work on this. Um, I run a long-term care ombudsman program within the San Francisco Bay area, essentially all of the East Bay. And so we see a diverse group of residents who live in these settings. And I want to encourage the committee to, again, secondary, second the motion for a round pace program. But I also want to encourage you to really gain a deeper understanding of who is in skilled nursing facilities. I think sometimes we rely deeply on the idea that there is a qualification and so that's who it is. And not that in fact that people really fall within a range. And so as we look at this Bennett, let's actually play out a real time scenario of who is in skilled nursing and how they would qualify for these benefits and what that would look like. I also would say I'm slightly troubled by the notion and it's not just present here, but in general in the world that the best solution for everyone is to live at home. Many people, really benefit from living in congregate settings, from having that daily and ongoing community. It may not be for everyone, but it is for some, and we should also be working to make a congregate living safe, rather than just assuming everyone's going to go home. Chiefly as we have a crisis of caregiving staff across the country, but acutely in California. And if we are moving everyone to home-based settings, I am concerned we won't have the staffing to meet that need. We already don't as well as the fact that the increased exposure to possible abuse and risk, if not monitored appropriately. So I would really encourage the committee to actually really check in, particularly with some ombudsman programs, and walk through some case scenarios about those individuals that are really hard to place. Um, again, I want to thank you for your hard work, and I really can see California moving towards a more inclusive aging system. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. Next, we've got Elna Times. I'll know your line's unmuted on our end. Okay. Um, how about Sharon? Sharon, your line's open as well. 
guidance sharing report on the corporation for supportive housing. Um, sorry, there's an echo. Um, can you still hear me? Yes. Karen, looks like all the senses. we can hear you. Okay. okay. Thank you. I appreciate the acknowledgement of people experiencing homelessness and housing instability when considering long-term care. Um, according to DHCS data from about five years ago, about 11,000 people residing in skilled nursing facilities could be discharged if they had a home. Similarly, people experiencing homelessness are far more likely to be admitted to skilled nursing facilities to be younger when admitted and to remain in the SNF for longer than 90 days. Well, I completely agree with the idea of increasing slots for programs designed to keep people out of institutions. We know from experience these current programs um, are not connecting successfully um, to housing and they're not, deserved to, uh, serve, they're not designed to serve people experiencing homelessness. So we therefore recommend using service providers with cultural competency and addressing homelessness to help people stabilize in housing, including homeless service providers. We are hoping the benefit can fund housing navigation and tenancy support services to allow people to gain access to housing and remain stable housed, while also connecting people to other HCBS services that allow people to live independently. We further recommend spending time to build capacity in creating partnerships with homeless and housing systems and establishing relationships and brokering agreements with supportive housing. The assisted living waiver program, for example, could work well to keep people out of institutional care if operating in supportive housing. Only one site offers ALW services in supportive housing right now. A medical approach applied to social services could never be successful in reaching this vulnerable population. I uh, thank you for all that you're doing and uh, look forward to having further conversations about this population. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, just a quick reminder for folks who have comments, if you, um, if we do not have the chance to get to you today or you think of other comments um, after the meeting, you are welcome to um, email LTC at home at dhcs.ca.gov if it's related to long-term care at home. And for meeting feedback and master plan for aging public comment, you can email the engage inbox at engage at aging.ca.gov. Um, next, we will take uh, Teresa. Teresa, your line is open. Okay. Um, Teresa, we'll swing back around and we'll move on to Debbie Toth. Debbie? Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Fabulous. Hello everybody and thank you for your work on this. And I want to echo the sentiments of Marty and Karen on the LTSS subcommittee. And I do want to highlight Nicole's comments, Nicole Howell from mm -hmm. Ombudsman, recognizing that um, there is a total continuum, and we have seen with CCT that there are plenty of people who do live in skilled nursing facilities in the absence of COVID that don't need to be there, and there are people that do, and recognizing that all of these things are true is super important, and that we have capacities, as Denise Liker pointed out, we have capacities to do things that may be outside of whatever the licensing structure is. It's a matter of how do we capitalize on existing infrastructure and expertise? So for example, when adult day healthcare became CBAS, became a Medi-Cal managed care benefit, um, it was MSSP sites that were contracted with to do the eligibility determinations for those sites. We have the ability to pivot, turn, and do all kinds of things like we did with CBAS with our tasks magically recently. So I think that there's all kinds of opportunities if we look and if we make a commitment to the fact that we keep whole our existing infrastructure and build on that to make this benefit whole, particularly as the person before me talked about in terms of homeless services, there's so much more we can do. And I don't believe that 1915C waivers are mutually exclusive with 1915I. I just think there's a lot we can look at and more we can bring to the conversation as long as our forefront is how do we 
how do we focus on the, the, the expertise and infrastructure that we have to build and serve? Thank you so much for the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Teresa, I just want to acknowledge that it looks like your line is open on your end, so you should be able to jump in. Yes, hi, this is Teresa Ogan. I'm the site director um, with a couple of sites for MSSP. And I want to, one, thank the, the work of the committee. I think you all are doing great work and you're bringing up some, some really um, you know, vital options that are, are, are already there and could be grown. I especially want to um, second what Denise Liker and uh, Debbie Toth have said. These are, these are valuable um, proven programs that can be grown and adapted in new ways of, and, of implementing services and, and become more creative. And, and we've seen some of that. Um, I think I, I've been um, impressed with how the state and, and to some degree the federal government have have allowed you know, some creativity to happen around how we implement services during COVID-19. Um, and, and I really think that we can continue to do that work and grow those boxes um, and grow out of those boxes with a little bit more flexibility in what we're doing in our current programs. We don't need a bunch of new programs. We need to allow the programs that have the expertise and are already in existence to continue and to, to grow and inform what we're doing in the communities now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, ne we, next, we've got Pat Blaisdell. Pat, your line is open. Um, good morning, and thank you for the opportunity. I want to um, add my voice to thanking the work of the LTSS subcommittee, excellent summaries and discussion, and also acknowledge that um, I was pleased to be able to participate in one of those 22 stakeholder meetings that J.C. Cooper uh, referenced. First of all, I want to align my comments with those of Nicole Howell, her very eloquent comments about the um, need for some congregate living settings to be part of our continuum care is, is incredibly important. And I think the issues she brought forward are, are um, key to this work going forward. I also just want to make um, one suggestion and comment that um, I know we've touched on other arenas. When we talk about uh, individuals who are residing in skilled nursing facilities and those individuals who might be able to be un, uh, cared for under this long-term care home at benefit. There really are, um, well, multiple different um, needs, but um, there are two major types of care that is being offered, and I'm, and I'm not sure that we're always keeping those in mind. One is those folks who actually need some skilled nursing medical care when they first leave the hospital or whatever setting they're in and need um, a continued medical care, therapy care to help them continue their recovery from a medical event. That, that happens in skilled nursing now, it can sometimes happen at home. Long-term care on the other hand is kind of a different uh, level of service. Some patients who initially required skilled nursing medical care go on to require some level of long-term care. When we're talking about who we're caring for at home and what the benefit is, we need to keep that distinction in mind. Some need short-term medical transitional care to continue their recovery. Some need ongoing um, residential care to help them continue to live as independently as possible in the context of chronic conditions or disabilities. And both of those things need to be considered. Some need A, some need B, some need both. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, next, we've got Greg Thompson. Greg, your line is open. Hi, thank you uh, for this opportunity to comment. First and foremost, I wanna thank you guys for extending the uh, public comment. I think that's outstanding. I only wish there were more uh, consumers and actual end users on. My comment is specifically to IHSS and discharge from hospital or um, in the, the interaction with the uh, moving people experience and homelessness. Um, some of them need more complex or more experienced care than uh, the traditional IHSS worker uh, is able to provide. And I'm certainly not suggesting that we move away from the independent provider mode or self-directed um, care because I believe you can self-direct care uh, when you have a trained worker. I would just suggest that you might look at expanding uh, the levels of IHSS, uh, the workforce, maybe offer more training 
and a higher pay for those. Thank you very much. Thank you, Greg. Um, I think next we have Lisa, Lisa Coleman. Your line's open. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to echo the thank you to the group. This has been um, a very thoughtful proposal, but I do want to echo some of my ongoing concerns. I, I, I really chafe at some of the vilifying that I hear about uh, skilled nursing and assisted living facilities. And I, I caution this committee about some of the language that they use. We're already seeing older adults that are not getting the rehabilita rehabilitative services that they need to improve the quality of life. And they are not looking for assisted living out of fear that these are death traps. And this is a very one-sided conversation. I have yet to see any data that's talking about the number of older adults that have been exposed to COVID from IHSS workers. We don't hear about that. And yet we do know that IHSS workers consistently work in facilities as well as providing at-home care. And so for the same reason that these skilled nursing and assisted living facilities are vulnerable to the virus being brought in by workers, our, our IHSS residents or recipients are also at risk, but we don't hear about that. And I worry that there are family members that are not getting the care that they need. They're not going to look to assisted living out of a fear that is, is blown out of proportion. And so I caution some of the language. I think we do need to support and resource many wonderful um, at-home programs and day programs and the assisted living waiver, but we will always have a need for long-term care. And I caution the way we treat the people that live there. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Eli Gillardin? Eli, your line's open. Okay, Eli, we'll, we'll come back to you. Um, we're gonna move on to C. McPherson. Great, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I'm Catherine McPherson. I'm the Chief Nutrition Officer for Mom's Meals. And we are a provider of fully prepared, medically tailored uh, meals delivered to the home um, nationwide. So we work with about 355 health plans in the US and about 20 uh, managed Medi-Cal, Cal, Cal MediConnect, and Medicare Advantage plans in California. Um, so thank you for your work and for the ability to comment. Um, I want to just raise awareness that we are you know, here um, in California and very um, willing to play a role in long-term care. Um, and in rapid response. Um, for example, we are uh, currently serving hospital at home programs throughout the US as um, there has been a rise in those programs as well to decompress hospitals across the country. Um, we are able to reach any address at, you know, at any time and we have no waiting lists. Um, we do partner with, with health plans, as I said, but very willing um, and also partner with some of the MSSP sites, um, but willing to play a larger role there. And also, you know, directly and in complementary to uh, the many great CBOs uh, throughout the state. Um, so just wanted to um, put ourselves out there as a resource to you throughout the process, uh, but as a willing partner as we further sort of flesh out the long-term care at home uh, benefit. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. And Eli, it looks like uh, your, your mic is open. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Eli Gelardin, Marin Center for Independent Living and California Foundation for independent living centers. Uh, very exciting to see all the opportunity that could come with this new benefit. I just also wanted to call out another resource that hasn't been mentioned, which is the uh, Hospital to Home Transition Fund or Department of Rehabilitation Transition Fund. This is a fund that independent living centers have been using for over a decade to facilitate transitions to get individuals with disabilities, including older adults, out of uh, long-term care facilities and back into home. Uh, it can be used for things like caregiving, uh, rental deposit, household items, and assistive technology. And you know, as we look at existing infrastructure and resources, I would just like us to be intentional about um, best practices and so sources like the Transition Fund 
it could be scaled out and expanded, as well as building upon the infrastructure of aging and disability resource connections, which is another emerging partnership that everyone is familiar with at this point. So thank you so much, really appreciate the work and look forward to the steps ahead. Thank you, Eli. And that appears to complete all uh, the people who are here today to make public comment. We'll pause a second and see if there's any last call. We do have a couple more minutes. Uh, we do have one additional person that just raised their hand, um, looks like two, uh, Elna. Elna, your line is open. There we go. Okay. Um, I would like to ask for some of the resources that we've been hearing about today to be listed somewhere on an easily findable web page when people are asking simple questions about what can I do? How can I hope, cope with this? We have an awful lot of people out there who are unpaid caregivers who are suddenly thrust into the role of being decision makers for their patient and not knowing where all to look. Um, the master plan on aging would be a great place to refer people to a list of resources, such as, for instance, the ones that were just mentioned by the independent living centers, um, the, the funds that are available for hospitals at home. Nobody, nobody in the public really knows about the existence of those things. Um, I think the MPA would do a tremendous benefit by opening up to the public the, the list of these kinds of resources and what they can do. Um, a lot of the people who come to um, the position of being caretakers uh, bring with them only their, their best intent to care for their loved one without knowing what to do. And the process of education is long, um, tiring, uh, very confusing. And, um, you know, the MPA could do a great benefit by providing information in an easily findable place. So that's my input. Thank you. Thank you, Elna. And our last comment is from Marissa. Marissa, your line is open. Marissa, it looks like you're self-muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. I just want to second the comment regarding um, IHSS funding and the hours increase. We definitely need uh, a um, a we need we need a mechanism to increase the amount of hourly wage. Um, we have a care increase because we I mean we have a care. Uh, deficit because people don't see these jobs as viable. Um, so I think that if we raise the um, income hourly wage, people might see them as viable, I hope. I also think that if it's possible to increase the um, hours um, that people can get, um, especially now during COVID, it's really been problematic uh, for myself and others to have attendance do what we need to have done, especially with the extra chores that need to be done um, because of COVID. It's really problematic. So I'd like the committee to look at um, how both these things, the hourly wage and the hour cap can be increased. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, I think um, that was our last public comment and I'll turn it over to Kim McCoy Wade to wrap us up. Thank you, Maria. Uh, I just want to make sure, uh, as a member of the public reminds us, that everybody is aware of resources in this time of great need and great challenge. Uh, two things, aging.ca.gov has many resources for you. Uh, there's also the state 1-800-AGING hotline for all adult and disability, 1-800-510-2020. That will connect you to your local area agency on aging your local No Wrong Door Aging and Disability Resource Connector, help you get to the friendship line for 24-7 behavioral health. Uh, and of course, there's always 211 expanding now in most communities for food and basic needs and 911 if you're really in crisis. It's tough times. We need to take care of each other and watch out for each other. So please do uh, help us stay connected. I do want to thank everyone for the incredible conversation and hand it over to Will and JC for the last word today. 
just to, to join in saying thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kim, for um, very able uh, facilitation. Um, and uh, as JC said at the uh, top of the meeting, um, we'll be back to people in four to six weeks with the next iteration and, and the schedule. Nothing really much else to add. Kim appreciated the conversation, discussion, and comments today from everybody um, and continue the conversation um, as we go. Thank you. Be well.